Hello everybody, this is again Dr. Tima Dekajan. So today I will be talking about the, the Integrated Ombudsman Scheme 2021. It's a mechanism of ensuring that the customer grievances are redressed in an inexpensive and expeditious manner and those grievances against Reserve Bank of India regulated entities like banks, non-banking financial companies, payment systems providers, etc. Earlier there was the banking ombudsman scheme, which was the first of those schemes which came about there. Then subsequently, that is along with the NBFC and the digital transactions uh, ombudsman have been combined to make this integrated ombudsman scheme. So we just see those aspects relating to the schemes, uh, the functioning of the scheme, etc. So first, the word ombudsman has its origin in Sweden, and basically, it's a, an ombudsman is an independent official. And what is his job to investigate complaints uh, against whom government uh, officials and agencies? So basically, something like a Lokpal in India is originally what ombudsman is supposed to be. So ombudsman is a person who investigates reports on help settle complaints. So this is the Merriam-Webster uh, dic dictionary meaning of what an ombudsman is, and the Cambridge deals with uh, more in terms of what kind of ombudsman that we have. Uh, that is official who deals with complaints made by public against government or government organizations like banks, insurance, etc. And incidentally, we have an ombudsman for banks. We have an ombudsman for insurance companies as well. Then under the insurance ombudsman rules 2017, you have the insurance ombudsman. Then you have telecom ombudsman. So the, then you have the local at the apex level uh, dealing with the corruption related cases, etc. So. This ombudsman is something which has grown in popularity. So, but the first of the ombudsman schemes that came up uh, is the banking ombudsman scheme, which was introduced in 1995 and it was effective from 14 June 1995. So, there were various changes which were brought about in the scheme this time. So, initially it was a private bank arrangement that was made. Subsequently, it was taken over by Reserve Bank. The appellate provisions, etc., were changed. The new grounds of deficiency depending upon the evolving uh, the scenario of banking services delivery, they have been added into. Then in between, there was when, uh, Banking Codes and Standards Code of India, which came. So the commitments, Code of Commitments for customers and then non-compliance with the code also became a ground for deficiency. So like that, then digital uh, transactions, then credit card transactions, ATM and uh, debit card transactions. So all of these, the system evolved, the appellate mechanism evolved. Uh, so there were amendments in 2002, uh, 2006, 2007, 2009, and 2017. So the scheme which was in existence uh, was the amended banking ombudsman scheme, 2006. Then the objective of the ombudsman scheme uh, is, was uh, to enable resolution of complaints relating to certain services rendered by banks and to facilitate the satisfaction or settlement of such complaints. So certain services, so basically there was a list of grounds of complaints and those services which were being rendered by the bank, which were falling within those, if there is a deficiency in respect of those, then the complaint uh, was, uh, could be made to the banking ombudsman. So what is the power under which this uh, ombudsman rule, uh, what is the scheme was introduced? It was an exercise of powers under section 35A of the Banking Regulation Act, where uh, in the interest of banking policy, in the interest of uh, customers, the depositors, etc. RBA has the power to issue directions to a bank or a group of banks. So in this particular case, it's a direction which is given by the Reserve Bank of India to uh, the scheduled commercial banks, then scheduled cooper urban cooperative banks, and then regional rural banks. So the scheme was applicable to these uh, banks. Then in 2018, uh, a similar ombudsman scheme was introduced for non-banking financial companies, which was titled uh, the Ombudsman Scheme for NBFCs, which was effective from 23rd February 2018. Then before the same scheme was subsumed into the integrated ombudsman scheme. Here, the objective was to enable resolution of complaints free of cost relating to certain aspects of services rendered by certain categories of NBFCs registered with RBI to facilitate the satisfaction and settlement of such complaints. So basically, NBFC is a very broad area. So in those certain institutions are regulated by Reserve Bank of India, like your loan companies, investment companies, asset financing companies. Now all of them have been merged into one category. 
then apart from that you have infrastructure finance companies core investment companies peer to peer lending platforms uh, then uh, account aggregators then infrastructure development funds so so many categories have come but not all those categories which are regulated uh, by reserve bank of india and registered are covered by the scheme similarly the insurance companies capital market intermediaries etc are also non banking financial company but they are not registered with rbi they are regulated by either irda or sebi or uh, in fact nidhi companies are regulated by the ministry of corporate affairs then chit fund companies are regulated by register of chit so these the scheme does not extend to all the nbfcs and the present integrated ombudsman scheme also does not ex extend to all entities it's basically intended for those entities which have been indicated to be covered by the scheme then the powers for this ombudsman scheme was uh, exercised uh, the scheme was issued exercising the powers under section 45 l under which rbi has power to give directions and call for information to financial institution which is a broader umbrella term so that that power has been used for issuing this scheme and the scheme is applicable to nbfcs authorized to accept public deposits then nbfc is non deposit taking with asset size of 100 crore and above and which have a customer interface it has not been made applicable to nbfcs which are infrastructure finance companies core investment companies infrastructure development funds and the nbfc under liquidation then the third scheme that was brought about with the increase in the payment system providers uh, uh, was uh, uh, digital wallets etc at that point of time we came out with a scheme called the integrated uh, sorry the ombudsman scheme for digital transactions this was introduced with effect on 31st um, january 2019 and the ombudsman scheme for digital transactions 2019 also got subsumed into the integrated ombudsman scheme so the objective again was the same thing satisfaction or settlement of claims regarding digital transactions undertaken by customers of system participants as defined under the scheme so here the system participants are those which are allowed to participate in the payment and settlement systems and the directions have been issued under section 18 of the payment and settlement systems act under which the uh, rbi has the power to issue directions uh, to payment system participants so here the scheme was applicable to system participants that is any person other than the bank participating in the payment system and it also excluded the system provider so it excluded banks it excluded the system provider that is those who were operating the payment systems then all these schemes were combined and the integrated ombudsman scheme was launched by the prime minister in 2021 and it was made effective from 12th november 2021 and the objective continues to be the same that is resolving customer grievances in relation to services provided by entities regulated by reserve bank of india in an expeditious and cost effective manner so the essential aspect of all this ombudsman is that it's an inexpensive expeditious and efficient mechanism of settlement of complaints basically trying the facilitation then second trying conciliation and mediation then third where the resolution is not possible by either of these methods then the banking ombudsman will go ahead the ombudsman will go ahead and either reject the complaint on the grounds and indicating the grounds or issue an award against the entity directing payment of compensation so the uh, integrated scheme is a, is a omnibus scheme applicable to all entities so the powers under omnibus regulations or laws have been exercised for issuing this so 35a of rbi banking regulation act 45l of rbi act for nbfc 35a for all categories of banks covered then section 18 for the payment system participants and it is applicable to rbi regulated entities unless it is excluded then single ombudsman for rbi regulated entities uh, as specified is the best and the most salient feature of the integrated ombudsman scheme and here earlier you had to know which ombudsman will deal with it and then give a complaint to the respective ombudsman now what you have to do is wherever you have an rbi regulated entity which is not excluded you send a complaint across and the ombudsman to whom the complaint is to be made 
it will be picked up by the uh, corresponding uh, ombudsman and earlier there used to be a issue relating to jurisdiction that is the place where the branch is located or in case of uh, the, uh, what is it internet uh, banking or uh, uh, debit card etc the place where the uh, residence billing address of the customer is located so those were the jurisdiction now you don't need to bother about the jurisdiction you only have to give a complaint rbi has its own mechanism of passing it on to the concerned uh, ombudsman so two problems are not there which ombudsman to send you just send it to rbi's uh, integrated ombudsman they will uh, in turn pass it on to the concerned uh, ombudsman then jurisdiction also you don't have to bother about where which ombudsman's office you will have to uh, place it will be taken care of by the processing center which has been set up then grounds of the complaint so basically deficiency of service has been defined there and is the ground for filing complaint there. then there is a list of exclusions on the grounds of on which you cannot make a complaint there. so earlier there used to be a laundry list of items on which complaints can be made in respect of banks in, in 2006 it was about 21 then in 2017 it was further expanded etc so but Finally, now what you have is every complaint can be sent, but the following categories of complaints are not admissible is what is indicated. So there is only a negative list. And then every deficiency not excluded will now be a ground for complaint. And to facilitate the process of uh, managing the complaints, RBA has set up a centralized receipt and processing center, which is located at Chandigarh for receiving the complaints which are in physical email form received across offices of RBI, then they are uh, entered into processed and then forwarded to the concerned uh, ombudsman for resolution. Then another important aspect is two categories of persons are now uh, handling the complaints. One is called the ombudsman and the second is the deputy ombudsman. So with distinct roles, uh, while the ombudsman can do everything, uh, specifically he can he is the only one who can do rejection of a complaint, uh, which is maintainable. And second is, he is the only one who can give an award. But the deputy ombudsman will fill in because the volume of complaints have increased. Uh, the deputy ombudsman can reject inadmissible or non-maintainable complaints. That is those which don't form the grounds uh, of complaint or where the procedural aspects are not appropriately met. So those complaints can be rejected by the deputy ombudsman. And those complaints which are settled amicably the closure of those complaints can be ordered by the deputy ombudsman. Then, earlier there used to be no provision relating to appeal by the financial institution or a bank against the rejection order. But here, the scheme provides for a appeal even where the complaint has been rejected. Because even if the complaint is rejected, there could be a direction that could be given or there could be other places where these complaints would land up eventually. So from that point of view, the appeal provision has been provided uh, for that also. Then the other important aspect is uh, that to enable the banks and the system participants or NBFCs to provide information and provide documents expeditiously, wherever the ombudsman indicates that you have to furnish the information or you have to furnish the uh, written reply, in respect of the complaint, if the regulated entity does not provide that, then they will be, the ombudsman will treat as if the complaint, uh, they, they don't have anything to say in respect of the complaint and he will be in a position to either pass an award or pass an order rejecting the complaint. But where an award or an order is passed by the ombudsman, the right to appeal for the regulated entity will be denied in case they fail to furnish the information within the period specified by the Ombudsman. So that's a very important thing which is enabled uh, or which is intended to bring out the benefit of uh, the regulated entity submitting information and complete set of documents in time. Then uh, the other aspect is the appellate authority earlier was the deputy governor who is in charge of the department which is administering the scheme, which is the Consumer Education and Protection Department of RBA. Now it has been, the executive director has been made uh, the appellate authority for dealing with the appeals. Then the scheme of the integrated ombudsman scheme is, you have chapter one, which talks about the preliminary aspects, uh, clauses one to three. 
Then chapter two talks about the offices under the Reserve Bank uh, Integrated Ombudsman Scheme 2021. Then chapter, th this has clauses from four to seven. Chapter three talks about the powers and functions. So what, what is the Ombudsman's role, et cetera, and the Deputy Ombudsman's role. Then chapter four talks about the procedure of redressal of grievance under the scheme. Chapter five deals with the miscellaneous aspects of 19 and 20. And uh, chapter four basically deals with the settlement of complaints amicably through facilitation, then conciliation and mediation, then award, then rejection, then appeal, and the disposal of the appeal. So all this is covered in, in the, uh, the most important operational aspects relating to the scheme are from nine to 18. Then uh, miscellaneous provisions, 19 and 20. The, basically savings and also the repeal and savings part and also the popularization of the scheme are those which are contained in the chapter 5 which is dealing with miscellaneous aspects. Then annexure is the form of complaint to be lodged with the ombudsman. Now let us see individual provisions. So preliminary aspect is basically the short title commencement etc. So it's the integrated ombudsman scheme 2021 effective from 21st November 2021 and it extends to the whole of India, and it applies basically to the services provided by a regulated entity in India. So whatever services are provided abroad, they will not be covered in the, uh, they cannot raise a complaint in relation to those services provided abroad for its customers. Uh, so under the provisions, so the services are provided uh, under either the Reserve Bank of India Act, in case of NBFCs, the Banking Regulation Act for banks, then Payment and Settlement Systems Act for the payment system participants. Then suspension of the scheme, there is a provision where uh, temporarily any clause or clauses of the scheme or the entire scheme could be suspended. And it could be suspended in respect of a specified regulated entity. And this order of suspension of the scheme can be issued by Reserve Bank of India. And with this period specified and where the circumstances continue, RBA can extend the period of uh, suspension of the scheme from time to time. Incidentally, 1995 till date, uh, there has never been an instance of the scheme being suspended. Then the definitions, important definitions are the appellate authority, as I already indicated, executive director in charge of department administering the scheme is the appellate authority. Then authorized representative, as it was there in the banking ombudsman scheme or the other schemes, an advocate cannot be an authorized representative, but it should be a person who is duly appointed and authorized in writing to represent the complainant in the proceedings before the ombudsman. Then what is a complaint? Basically, a complaint is a representation in writing or there is an email mechanism that is there, then you can you have an online mechanism of filing the complaint which is provided for. So any of these modes you can adopt and the, the representation could be in any of these modes. Then what should the representation be about in alleging a, a deficiency in service on the part of the regulated entity and seeking relief under the scheme. So that uh, representation that is made against a regulated entity for uh, seeking relief under the scheme presented through either of the modes like in writing physical form or through email or through online complaint. That is what is called as a complaint. Then deficiency of service has also been defined. So what is this deficiency of service? It's basically a shortcoming or inadequacy in a financial service which the regulated entity is required to provide statutorily or otherwise, which may or may not result in financial loss or damage to the customer. So, so imagine that there is a regulation that is indicated that this has to be done and the same is not done. Then it may result in a loss, it may not result in a loss, but if whatever direction that a regulated entity is supposed to statutorily comply, and if that is not done, and because of that, there is a shortcoming or inadequacy, in financial service, then irrespective of whether there is a loss or damage uh, to the customer, that will be qualifying to be a deficiency of the service. And once there is a deficiency of service, you can make a representation seeking relief under the Ombudsman scheme through a complaint in one of the modes that are there. Then what are the regulated entities? So as I told you, bank, non-banking financial company and system participant. 
as defined in the scheme will be the regulated entity and any other entity can be added as may be specified by Reserve Bank of India from time to time. What to the extent not excluded under the scheme? So certain institutions are excluded in the scheme itself. So to the extent not excluded, those are the regulated entities. Then what is a bank? So the regulated entity, your bank, what is the definition of bank or what is the coverage of bank? Then second, you have NBFC, what are the NBFCs covered? Then system participants, what are the systems? So these are the three definitions that are there. So bank is basically a banking company, corresponding new bank, a regional rural bank, state bank of India as defined in the Banking Regulation Act and Cooperative bank as defined in section 56C of the Banking Regulation Act to the extent not excluded under the scheme. So these are the banks. So uh, scheduled commercial banks, scheduled uh, is a regional rural banks, uh, then um, small finance bank, payment banks, etc. All of them are covered. Then urban cooperative banks, which are uh, scheduled, they are also covered under the scheme. But it does not include a bank in resolution or winding up or under directions or any other spe bank specified by RBI. So it does not extend to a bank which is in the process of going out or where RBI has specific, given specific directions. Then non-banking financial company is basically an NBFC as defined in section 45 IF of the RBI Act. Basically chapter 3B is the regulatory uh, framework for NBFC under that what is a non-banking financial company is defined in section 45 IF. So that is a non-banking financial company, but not all companies, but those registered with RBA to the extent not excluded un under the scheme. So those which are uh, not included are basically core investment company. That is a company which is having the predominantly a holding of shares of their group companies or subsidiary companies. That's a core investment company where there is no customer interface as well. Then an infrastructure development fund is a pooling of money for the purpose of infrastructure development, which is done by, with the non, by a non-banking financial company. Then an infrastructure finance company, a company which lends for infrastructure finance. Then a company in resolution or winding up or liquidation or any other NBFC specified by RBA. So these are all the non-banking financial companies to which the scheme extends. Then the next is, System participant. So system participant is basically something under the Payment and Settlement Systems Act 2007. A person other than RBI and a system provider participating in a payment system as defined in section, uh, as defined in Payment and Settlement Systems Act 2007 is a system participant. So what is, so Reserve Bank is not included because Reserve Bank has an important part to play in the payment and settlement system. Sir. Then system provider is basically someone who is providing the system, like in case of uh, National Payment Corporation of India, which is providing for uh, the various uh, payment systems that are there. Then you have uh, uh, Clearing Corporation of India Limited, etc., which is facilitating the um, settlement of transactions in the payment systems, uh, especially the money market, government securities market, forex market, etc. Then uh, these are excluded from the purview. So a person, system provider means and includes a person who operates an authorized payment system as defined in section two of the Payment and Settlement Systems Act. So these are the definitions. So now what are the offices of the RBA integrated ombudsman scheme? So first is talking about the appointment of ombudsman and deputy ombudsman. So it's the ombudsman are, and deputy ombudsman are appointed by Reserve Bank of India. So the purpose is to carry out the functions entrusted to them under the scheme. Then that is attempting resolution, issuing an award, rejecting complaints, and then reporting the matter to the top management in the form of an annual report. So these are broadly the main functions of the ombudsman. Then the tenure for appointment is not exceeding three years at a time, but they're eligible for reappointment. So generally the chief general managers or general managers are appointed as ombudsman. And where you have these, you could have general managers and deputy general managers who are appointed as deputy ombudsman. Then location of the office of ombudsman at places specified by Reserve Bank of India. So then ombudsmen are also permitted to hold sittings at other places and in such a manner and uh, 
as is considered necessary and proper by the ombudsman in respect of a complaint. So this ombudsman can take, uh, can be present outside the office also, and they can take up complaints uh, from an offsite uh, location also by holding their uh, sittings in those places. So, and in the same state, like in Delhi, you have uh, three ombudsmen who are operating there for different jurisdictions within, because <clears throat> the Delhi ombudsman has jurisdiction over uh, Haryana, uh, Delhi, then uh, national capital region, etc. So, with the number of complaints that are more, then you have more number of ombudsmen. Like in Bombay, you have two ombudsmen, etc. So, that way, the places are decided by Reserve Bank of India depending upon the volume of complaints. And even within the jurisdiction, wherever they want, they can hold a sitting and resolve the complaints there. Then, this is an improvement that has been brought about uh, to facilitate the receipt and processing of complaints. So, Reserve Bank to establish a centralized uh, receipt and processing center at any place has decided and it has decided to set it up at Chandigarh. What is the purpose of this processing center? It receives complaints filed under the scheme and processes them. So, the modes of complaint received are basically online complaints which can be registered at portal where there is no need for intervention of the CRPC. But uh, where the, the complaint is received through an email or physical complaints in postal, hand delivered, or forwarded by regulators or forwarded by government, etc. Those kind of complaints, they will have to be sent to the uh, CRPC for scrutiny and initial processing, and they will slot it to the concerned ombudsman for uh, dealing further with it. Then the staffing of the, the ombudsman, it is fully funded and fully staffed by Reserve Bank of India. So how many people should be there? They are all employed in Reserve Bank. At one point of time when the scheme started, uh, till 2002, it was the bankers uh, uh, who were the member, who were the state level bankers committee in charge. Those bankers employees were also working with the ombudsman scheme. And the ombudsman used to be people from, uh, what is it, banking system, from judiciary, et cetera. So those, that scenario has gone after 2002 when the total scheme was taken over by Reserve Bank of India. So even the cost of administering the scheme is borne by Reserve Bank of India. This is unlike in certain countries uh, where the, uh, the banks are asked to contribute. And in case of insurance ombudsman also, the cost of the, the scheme is administered by the general uh, council of insurance on, uh, Council Council of Insurance Companies. So in this, so the total cost of the scheme is distributed there and borne by the insurance companies in case of an insurance ombudsman. Executive Council of Insurers is the one which administers the uh, insurance ombudsman scheme. And all the insurance companies contribute there in proportion to their premium collected for the scheme. So, but in this particular case of integrated ombudsman, it is totally funded by Reserve Bank of India. Then what are the powers and functions? So basically what does the ombudsman do is what is contained in this chapter three, which has uh, section eight or clause eight. So here ombudsman or deficiency ombudsman consider complaints of customers of regulated entities relating to deficiency of service where the ombudsman can address and close all complaints. The deputy ombudsman can close only non-maintainable complaints under clause 10 and complaints settled through facilitation under clause 14. So there is no limit on the amount of dispute, amount in dispute which can be brought before the ombudsman or for which the ombudsman can pass a, an award. So the only limit that is there is on the consequential loss for which compensation can be ordered. So, the compensation that can be ordered by an ombudsman is not, should be not more than the compensation, uh, consequential loss cost suffered by the complainant on account of the deficiency of service or 20 lakhs of rupees, whichever is lower. So if the compensation, if the loss suffered is 10 lakhs, then 10 lakhs is ordered. If the loss suffered is uh, 30 lakhs, if it is agreeable to the complainant, an award maximum can be given is 20 lakhs only by the ombudsman. Then, in addition to it, for the complainant's time uh, loss, which is caused because of 
running behind in resolving his complaint, then for the expenses incurred in terms of uh, pursuing his complaint, and for the harassment or mental anguish suffered. An additional amount of compensation of up to 1 lakh can be ordered by the ombudsman. So in this particular case, the, the, the bank is supposed to pay that amount. Then this is a discretionary kind of an amount which is uh, there, but as far as the compensation is concerned, there is no discretion. It is only up to the extent of uh, consequential loss suffered by the complaint. Then ombudsman is also supposed to send a report to the deputy governor of Reserve Bank of India as on 31st March every year in the reviewing the activities of the office and other information as Reserve Bank may direct. And RBI may publish the report and information received from ombudsman in a consolidated form or otherwise. So every year, the each office of the insurance ombudsman will furnish a, a report to the deputy governor indicating what are the total number of complaints, what is the analysis of complaints, pendency, the major grounds of complaints, etc. generated from the system and uh, their comments being furnished in relation to those complaints. Then uh, they also indicate what are the important categories of uh, uh, complaints which are received and the important awards or decisions that they have issued. And then all this will be consolidated and uh, the annual report of ombudsman is issued by Reserve Bank of India every year, in which the total consolidation of all the complaints, then the pendency, then key aspects of complaints, instructions issued by Reserve Bank of India in customer service, all those are given and the important awards or decision of the ombudsman are also picked and uh, circulated so that uh, people get benefited out of uh, that. If they have a similar case, they can show that. Though the, there is no presidentiary value for uh, president value for the decisions of the ombudsman because it's not a judicial forum, it's just an administrative or a quasi judicial forum. But uh, there has to be consistency and for similar ground, they have to have a similar approach. Then RBI may publish the report as I told you. So this is as far as the powers and functions are concerned. Then So chapter four talks about the procedure for grievance redressal. So basically grounds of complaint uh, is dealt with in clause nine. It says any customer aggrieved by an act or omission of a regulated entity resulting in deficiency of service may file a complaint under the scheme. How can, how can he file? Either he can file personally or through an authorized representative and that our authorized representative should be in writing and he should be other than a, an advocate. So, and the modes of filing the complaints is already through the portal or through physical or through electronic mode. Then there is a negative list of uh, complaints. So, section rule 10 says, or clause 10 says, no complaint shall lie in matters involving the following. So, where there is a commercial judgment or commercial decision of a regulated entity like someone has not been given a loan and the bank has indicated that you don't qualify and i have i can't give you the loan so in which case it's a commercial judgment or a commercial decision so no complaint in respect of that can lie then second a dispute between the vendor and the regulated entity relating to an outsourcing contract so these days you have employees who are outsourced or works like business correspondent relationship uh, which is outsourced so you, if there is a dispute between these two, you can't use the ombudsman channel for re redressing those complaints. Then a grievance not addressed to the ombudsman directly. So you cannot send this back copies, BCC or uh, CC kind of a thing where you are writing to the bank and then you are passing on the uh, what is it, carbon copy to RBA ombudsman. Those kind of complaints will not be accepted. Then general grievances against the management or executives of a regulated entity. So these are not some things uh, which the uh, ombudsman can intermediate and settle. So they, there's no reason why they should be accepting these kind of complaints. Then a dispute in which action is initiated by a regulated entity in compliance with the orders of a statutory or law enforcing authority. Suppose there is a uh, an account has been frozen based on an order of the court. So then on that ground, they cannot come and raise a complaint before the banking ombudsman or the, or, or the ombudsman. So here, the stoppage of the account is based on an order of the court or a statutory, maybe income tax recovery or income tax authority or 
enforcement directorate could uh, impose a freeze. So that dispute, you can't bring it to the ombudsman and seek resolution. Then a service which is not within the regulatory purview of RBA. So basically banking, non-banking payment system related services are those which are covered within the regulatory purview of RBA under the Banking Regulation Act, Chapter 3B of RBA Act and the Payment and Settlement Systems Act. So if this is not there and there is any other thing that is uh, the service relating to which there is a complaint, RBA will not entertain because its jurisdiction is limited to the functions which fall within their regulatory purview. And if there is a dispute between regulated entities, suppose there is a check and uh, uh, it has been wrongfully paid and there is a dispute between the uh, two bankers who should be held liable. Those kind of dispute between the paying banker and the collecting banker kind of a thing, they cannot be resolved by using the Reserve Bank of India's uh, channel or there is an NBFC which has an issue with the bank. Those kind of disputes cannot be resolved, uh, got resolved through the ombudsman scheme. Then any dispute which is involving an employee-employer relationship of a regulated entity, that is also not something which can be entertained by the ombudsman. So any complaint relating to deficiency of service can be provided. However, in respect of the following grounds, no complaint can be entertained by the ombudsman. So that is the, so there is only a negative list of complaints. So then grounds of non-maintainability of uh, a complaint. So procedural requirements are also there. Like a written complaint has to be first made to the regulated entity and only when the, the request that has been made for resolution, if it has been rejected wholly or partly by the regulated entity and the complainant is not satisfied with the reply, in that case, he can make a complaint. He can't straight away come to the uh, ombudsman for resolution. So first opportunity has to be given to the regulated entity and if they don't give you the requisite relief or you're not satisfied with the reply or the relief, then you can come to the ombudsman. And second thing is, if no reply is received 30 days after you have given a complaint, then also you can come to the uh, ombudsman. And in which case the complaint, within what time it has to be filed with the ombudsman. So the complaint has to be filed within one year of the receipt of the reply from the regulated entity or where no reply has been received one year, one month from the date of making a complaint to the regulated entity a complaint can be made. So if it is beyond this period, then the complaint can be rejected as uh, non, uh, non maintainable. And if it is comes to the ombudsman, even before going to the regulated entity, it will be treated as a first resort complaint and it will be forwarded to the regulated entity, but rejected by the Reserve Bank of India. Then the complaint is not in respect to the same cause of action, which is pending before or settled or dealt with on merits by the ombudsman or pending before settled or dealt with by court, tribunal, or arbitrator, or any other form or authority. So, where a matter is already disposed of or pending, you don't need to give another complaint. The decision of the ombudsman will come. Where the matter is pending before any other forum, court, arbitrator, tribunal, etc. So, there is no reason because they are more competent and more comprehensive in terms of their coverage. So, it's not necessary that you should come to the Ombudsman. So these complaints are also rejected as non-maintainable, where either previously disposed of or pending with Ombudsman or disposed of or pending before any court authority or tribunal, including arbitration. Then certain complaints which are not uh, entertained as maintainable complaints are those complaints which are abusive, frivolous or vexatious or repeatedly someone keeps giving complaints or for no reason something which is very silly if they are giving a complaint or if they are being very abusive in the language that they are using within the complaint the ombudsman is free to reject this complaint saying that it is not maintainable then if the, the complaint has to be made before the uh, limitation period so suppose there is a recovery that is supposed to be made so three years in the general period after the making the demand, if it is not coming, then you will have to file a limitation, uh, file a uh, complaint. So there has to be, the complaint to the regulated entity has to be made. So be it to beat the limitation, after limitation, if you are going to the regulated entity, and if they don't respond, then you can't come to the ombudsman. So their uh, grievance should be within limitation. Only then you should be uh, approaching. Then the complaint provides complete information as required under clause 11. So all the details that are required for handling a complaint along with the necessary documents have to be provided. 
then the complaint is lodged by complainant personally or through the authorized representative other than an advocate so the only instance where an advocate can file a complaint is when he is he himself has a complaint grievance as an aggrieved person he can file then explanations so uh, there are two explanations provided uh, where it is a written complaint uh, it means complaints made through other modes where proof of making complaint can be produced suppose i am going and filing the Uh, an email and i can have an acknowledgement or read receipt kind of a thing that that will be treated as a written complaint similarly i am doing it online i am getting an acknowledgement token number etc that also can be treated as a written complaint then same cause of action does not include criminal proceedings pending before or decided by court or tribunal or any police investigation initiated by in a criminal offence so it cannot that will be not be treated as a same cause of action then uh, procedure for filing a complaint is the channels of proceeding of uh, filing a complaint is provided for in section 11 that is may be lodged online through the portal which is cms.rbi.org.in then it can be submitted through the electronic mode through email or through physical mode by addressing it either to the centralized receipt and processing center or to any of the offices of rbi then it submitted in the physical form it has to be signed by the complainant or his authorized his or her authorized representative and the format of complaint is as specified by reserve bank of india in the annex shared to the scheme then the initial scrutiny of the complaints is handled by the ombudsman uh, office what do they do those complaints which are in the nature of offering suggestions or seeking guidance or explanation they are not maintainable and they are rejected they have forwarded to the concerned department uh, for necessary examination but they will not be treated as complaints for the purpose of processing so they will have to be rejected as non maintainable so all the other complaints they will be assigned to the concerned officers for of ombudsman for further examination then an intimation of having uh, marked it for examination will be given to the complainant then the complainant along with the documents will be forwarded to the regulated entity with a direction to submit its written version within time specified then the ombudsman has power to call for information so for carrying out his duty which is resolution of complaint or uh, facilitation conciliation mediation or uh, finally rejection or issuance of an award for that purpose an ombudsman may require a regulated entity against whom the complaint has been made or any other regulated entity to provide information suppose i have an atm card which i have used on this uh, my bank is icici bank i have used it in uh, in a hdfc bank atm so the complaint will be raised against icici bank but the information relating to the machine transaction has to be taken from hdfc bank so the ombudsman in an atm complaint can ask for information from hdfc bank also which is the atm that has been used though i am a customer of icici bank so that way they can ask for providing information in furnished certified copies of any document related to the complaint and uh, draw an information in inference that it has no information to furnish if the entity fails to comply so if the entity fails to comply then they will think that they have nothing to say and the ombudsman will go ahead and uh, decide the matter then confidentiality of information in documents is supposed to be maintained by the ombudsman also however there are exceptions to this maintenance of confidentiality is one is where it is required by law to disclose the rb the ombudsman is bound to disclose and where it is necessary with the consent of the other party the information can be or the document can be shared with the with someone else then to the extent necessary for principles of natural justice that is i have to be given an opportunity of being heard or i have to see the document relating to which uh, the action is supposed to be there so in that interest if some document is supposed to be shared to that extent the ombudsman shares those documents between the parties then if there is a case that is filed before a court where ombudsman is asked to give the uh, information or disclose whatever proceedings are there or where uh, an action is initiated by the ombudsman office itself so in those kind of cases the documents 
and other information will have to be furnished. So you know, the confidentiality need not be maintained in those cases. Then resolution of complaints, the basic objective of the ombudsman scheme, as is any other ombudsman scheme, is to promote settlement by agreement between the parties. First, by facilitation. But what is the facilitation that they do? They, have, they receive a complaint. Then they send it to the, the regulated entity. The regulated entity gives its reply. Then it is forwarded to the uh, complainant. And if he is satisfied with whatever reply is given, after the ombudsman's intervention, that is what is facilitation. He's not done anything other than communicate it between the two parties. Then second thing he can do is bring the parties together and then act as a conciliator or mediator and enable settlement between the parties uh, for resolving the dispute. So that mechanism is called as conciliation or mediation. So then what is the procedure that can be adopted by the ombudsman is basically a summary proceeding and he is not bound by any rules of evidence. It's not a court that he is running. He is basically an administrative authority or a quasi-judicial authority. So the obligations of principles of natural justice are applicable in ombudsman in handling the complaints. Then he can examine any parties to the complaint and record their statement in resolution for resolution of the grievance. Then the regulated entity within 15 days of receipt of the complaint shall file a written version of its reply to the averments made in the complaint. And whatever documents it intends to rely upon will be enclosed, have to be enclosed, and it has to be furnished to Reserve Bank of India, so ombudsman uh, within 15 days. Sometimes if there is a, a genuine request that is made and the ombudsman is satisfied as to the reason for delay, the ombudsman can give more time. Then if the regulated entity fails to file the written reply or the documents, as I have indicated, the ombudsman may go ahead and think that they have nothing to uh, state in, the, in this matter or they have no document to prove. And accordingly, based on that, ombudsman can give an expert decision based on the available uh, evidence and the documents that are there and pass an order or they can issue an award. So in this particular case, the regulated entity will not have a right to appeal against the award issued on non-response or for not furnishing the information within the stipulated time. So this will act as a deterrent and it may promote, it will promote regulated entities to give information in a more timely manner so that resolution of complaints can also be done in an expeditious and timely manner. So then ombudsman and or deputy ombudsman have to ensure that the regulated entity's written reply with document is sent to the complainant and ensure that the reply or documents are shared to the extent relevant and follow such procedure and grant additional time as is appropriate. So this is all an aspect of first resolve, attempting resolution through facilitation. Then if it is not resolved through facilitation and still there is some thing amiss, then they will initiate action for conciliation and mediation and for this purpose, there could be a meeting of the complainant with the officials of the regulated entity at the instance of the ombudsman or in the presence of the ombudsman. Then the parties are required to cooperate in good faith with the ombudsman and deputy or deputy ombudsman in resolution of a dispute and comply with the direction for production of documents. So if at this stage of facilitation or amicable or conciliation or mediation, if an amicable settlement is received, is arrived at by the ombudsman or deputy ombudsman, then they will have to record that fact of settlement. Then they will have to record the terms of settlement and get this document signed by both the parties. And uh, there could be a timeline which can be specified to them for compliance with the terms of settlement. And once the compliance is done, the complaint will be closed as amicably resolved. Then in three instances, the complaint is deemed to be resolved. One is when it has been settled by the regulated entity and the complainant with ombudsman's intervention. So the settlement is there, then it will be deemed to have been resolved. Then when the complaint has agreed in writing or otherwise, and how he is indicating that he is agreeable to the settlement, he, that has to be recorded if he does not give it to the ombudsman in writing that the manner and extent of resolution is satisfactory. Then when the complainant has voluntarily withdrawn the complaint, in all these instances, it will be deemed that the complaint has been resolved. 
this is uh, section sorry class 49 then the next important part is the issuance of an award so where the documents or information is not furnished by the regulated entity then a next party kind of an order or decision or an award is supposed to be issued by the ombudsman then where the matter is not resolved by facilitation conciliation or mediation then the ombudsman can pass an award and the award has to be a reasoned award so this is also one of the important aspects of a uh, administrative authority which is taking uh, which is using its judicial power it has to follow the principles of natural justice and one of the essential elements uh, is a giving a reasoned order indicating why he is directing something to be done so what are the aspects that are considered by the ombudsman first the principles of banking law and practice then directions instructions guidelines issued by reserve bank of india and such other factors as may as may be relevant so the guidelines and the directions under the banking regulation act directions and guidelines under the non banking financial companies uh, uh, related uh, guidelines under chapter 3b and those relating to system participants under the payment and settlement system so all these are considered depending upon the kind of entity against whom the complaint is there then what is supposed to be there in the award is the the description of the complaint then the response of the um, regulated entity then the views of the ombudsman based on the position relating to principles of law practice etc and the directions of rbi etc and finally it will be about it should contain two aspects one what is the specific performance that is needed which is to be performed by a regulated entity so what you have to do this job you have to rework the loan so that the interest calculation is supposed to be set right so here there is it is indicating to the bank saying that you have to perform this specific obligation and respond so that is the first kind of a direction that will be there the second thing is pay an amount by way of compensation for any loss suffered by the complainant so here the pecuniary limit of the ombudsman will come into play he can award compensation only to the extent of consequential loss suffered by the complainant or 20 lakhs whichever is lower and wherever he finds that there is adequate reason where the complainant has been harassed and more time effort and other things have been taken or there is a case of harassment in mental language then he can add an additional 1 lakh rupees as compensation for these uh, uh, aspects which are in the nature of an indirect loss but the direct loss compensation has to be ordered so the award should contain these aspects also then once the award is issued a copy of the award has to be sent to the complainant as well as the regulated entity and if the complainant is acceptable to the resolution provided by the ombudsman then he will have to indicate that. so by giving a letter of acceptance of award and indicate that this i accept the award in full and final settlement of my claim vis-a-vis -vis the regulated entity and this letter of acceptance has to be furnished within 30 days of receipt of a copy of award in case they don't send it then the award will lapse and there is no obligation on the part of bank to comply with the award if they furnish this um, letter of acceptance the regulated entity will have to comply or he, he won't send it if he is taking up an appeal against the award of the ombudsman then the regulated entity if he is receiving a letter of acceptance and if he does not file an appeal will have to comply the order uh, comply with the uh, award within 30 days and communicate the compliance to the ombudsman in which case the the award will be closed otherwise it will be pending and it will be followed up by the reserve bank of india then the rejection of complaints so they, i told you the deputy ombudsman has a limited role in so far a settlement he can close the complaints which are settled second thing is he can only to a limited extent uh, uh, reject the complaints so what are the complaints he can reject those which are not maintainable under clause 10 and uh, if it is if the complaint is not a grievance but it is more in the nature of a suggestion or seeking guidance or explanation in those cases he can reject the uh, complaint whereas the ombudsman can reject maintainable complaint so here he will he will be doing 
the deputy ombudsman will be dealing with the non maintainable complaints so where the maintainability is true then the matter has been referred to the um, uh, to the regulated entity then conciliation meeting and other things happen then the rejection has to be taken and the ombudsman decides that the award has not is not warranted in this particular case he can reject the complaint so what are the grounds in this there are two classes one is those grounds where no appeal against the rejection order will lie what are those grounds one where the ombudsman feels uh, that there is no deficiency in service uh, so the bank whatever has done it has done appropriately the customer didn't understand that because of which the grievance has come in which case the ombudsman closes the complaint under this 162a the second thing is that the compensation sought uh, for the consequential loss is beyond the power of the ombudsman to award compensation as indicated in need to so here where the uh, compensation suppose direct loss caused uh, as per the uh, ombudsman and uh, the bank and the award is say about 10 lakh rupees but the fellow says that i have to pay 50 pay, be paid 50 lakh rupees so then the uh, direction could be for paying the 10 lakhs which is the actual compensation the ombudsman does not have power to issue order compensation more than what is the actual loss and in any case, not more than 20 lakhs. So in which case, the ombudsman will say that the complaint, he will close the complaint under section uh, six, uh, clause 16 to B, saying that you have, the compensation that you have sought is much beyond my purview. So you can go to any other forum for resolution. Then there are other four grounds on which the complaints can be closed. But if the closure is done for these reasons, or the rejection is done for these reasons, the parties, either the regulated entity or the, the complainant can approach the appellate authority. What are those grounds? First, the complaint is not pursued with reasonable diligence by the complainant. So where the ombudsman feels that he is not coming back and responding after I have sent him the reply, then the ombudsman can choose to um, reject the complaint of this ground. However, this will be an appealable uh, clause, appealable uh, order. The second thing is the complaint is without sufficient cause. So he finds that there is no sufficient cause for this complaint. Then he can reject. However, this will be also an appealable ground. Then the complaint requires consideration of elaborate documentary and oral evidence and the proceedings before the ombudsman are not appropriate for adjudication of a complaint. Suppose there is a tampering of the thing or forgery that is done in a document or where the ATM transaction has been done where the ombudsman is not able to know whether the card has been really parted with or it's some other mechanism. So in which case, the ombudsman is not someone who is a, like a police or a court where he can take up elaborate proceedings and uh, uh, get expert opinion, forensic inspect, investigation, etc. He can't do. He's basically a summary uh, disposal kind of an organization. So in which case, where the ombudsman feels that it's a case of fraud or some other uh, complicated matter. So he can close the complaint saying that the matter requires consideration of elaborate documentary and oral evidence and my forum is not the appropriate forum. You go elsewhere. So, but this will also be a, an appealable uh, rejection. If the ombudsman is of the opinion that there is no financial loss or damage or inconvenience caused to the complaint. So the deficiency of service does not mean that uh, it will be treated as deficiency it is not necessary that there has to be a loss but where the uh, the bank or the regulated entity has indicated that it has done whatever is appropriate in the particular case and it has rectified the issue etc then if the matter will have to be closed so that closure can be done by the ombudsman saying that in my opinion after whatever has been done, there is no financial loss or damage or inconvenience caused to the complainant. So I am rejecting the complaint. So these kind, these are the various clauses of rejection. Now, if someone is not satisfied with the order of rejection or with the um, closure under appealable clauses, they can prefer an appeal uh, to the appellate authority. And who is the appellate authority? The executive director who is in charge of the consumer education and uh, protection department of reserve bank of india then there is as i already told you no right for the regulated entity where the award is issued for non furnishing documents or information so appeal can be preferred by the regulated entity only if there is an award which is issued 
and this appeal also can be filed only when the letter of acceptance of the award has been received from the complainant right? in which case only the appeal can be filed then where there is a closure under the appealable grounds section 16 clause 16 to, to c to f then also an appeal can be filed by the regulated entity however just to prevent them from filing an appeal in every case the the scheme says that only with the previous sanction of the chairman or managing director or the chief executive officer or in their bar absence the executive director or a similarly ranked official only can file a an appeal before the Reserve Bank of India. So the intention is basically that only in the rare cases where there is something which is very, very wrong that the management feels, top management feels, they should file an appeal. Otherwise, they will have to comply with the orders of the ombudsman. And when, within which time the period the appeal has to be filed, within 30 days from the date of receipt of the letter of acceptance from of award from the complainant. Then, or where there is a rejection within 30 days of the communication of the closure of the complaint and award an appeal has to be filed before the appellate authority. Then a complainant can file an, an appeal against the award or against the closure. He will file an award in which case he won't give the letter of acceptance. So the moment he receives the award within 30 days, he will have to file the uh, appeal or where the rejection order is received within 30 days of it, he has to file the appeal and wherever in the regulated entity or the complainant, where there is sufficient cause shown that there is because of this, there was a delay and 30 days time has expired, the appellate authority can entertain the uh, complaint even beyond the 30 day period. Then the secretariat of the appellate authority will scrutinize the appeal and process the appeal. Then the appellate authority also decides on the appeal after giving the parties a, uh, an opportunity of being heard. Then there is no distinction in terms of the appellate authority in terms of either the, uh, the pecuniary jurisdiction or the procedure that he adopts, etc. So the only thing is he has the power to re-examine the order, but he will have uh, the decision which is passed by the appellate authority will be equivalent to the award of a ombudsman or rejection under the uh, by the ombudsman. So it's it's a re-examination of the case, but not a higher level of pecuniary jurisdiction or something like that. So what are the mechanisms that are there where the decision of the appellate authority would be? It could be to dismiss the appeal and uh, say that the original order or the award is appropriate. Then it could allow the appeal and set aside the award or the rejection order of the ombudsman. Or the third thing he can do is he can remand the matter back to the ombudsman for fresh disposal and give directions or that he feels appropriate. So you take these into consideration and then you reconsider your decision and then re-examine the matter and uh, decide on the particular case he can say. So this kind of remand can be ordered by the ombudsman. Then he can modify the order of the ombudsman or the award and pass such other directions as may be necessary to give effect to the order of the ombudsman or the award of the uh, ombudsman. Then he can pass any other order as he may deem fit. So the adjudicate appellate authority has power to do any of these aspects. Then the last is miscellaneous chapter talks about uh, the display of the scheme. So basically, regulated entity is supposed to popularize the scheme because it's an easier mechanism for ensuring customers uh, uh, a channel for resolution of their disputes without having to take recourse to any consumer forum or a court. So the regulated entity to which the scheme is applicable should facilitate smooth conduct by meticulous adherence to the requirements under the scheme. That is, wherever timelines are indicated, etc they will have to follow that and ensure that documents and other things are given. So wherever they don't provide that kind of a, a system, RBA will be free to take such action as it deems fit. Then for the purpose of administering the scheme at their own end, they have to appoint a principal nodal officer at the head office level and he should be a person of a rank not less than general manager. And at the other places also, they have to... In, uh, appoint nodal officers to assist the principal or no, nodal officer for operational efficiency. The general thing they do is 
wherever the RBI ombudsman offices are there, they will have one nodal officer. And finally, at the central level, they will have a principal nodal officer. The generally banks have a three tier system where the initial grievance officer, then the nodal officer, then the principal nodal officer. And the timeline generally is one week for each of these three. So after these three are over, then the ombudsman they, is the channel that they will ask to approach. But it is not necessary for the um, under the ombudsman scheme that they will have to go through the three. And now in the uh, for banks and for NBFCs, they have indicated that they should have an internal ombudsman. So the internal channels will be there, and an internal ombudsman is someone who is an is an outside. Uh, expert who will be sitting but operating within the bank appointed by the bank as an independent body to be examining the complaint before finally rejecting it from the bank side so uh, the indi the internal grievance channel then the e internal ombudsman and only then the complaints will come to have to come to reserve bank of india but how effective that system is something which not homogeneously effective across the entire uh, banking and the financial spectrum. Then these and these nodal officer and the principal nodal officers are also to represent the entity and for furnishing the information. And wherever periodic meetings are conducted by the ombudsman, they will be coming and they will be attending the meetings. Then they are also supposed to display prominently for the customer's benefit at the branches and the places of business, the name, contact details of the principal nodal officer and the details of the complaint portal of the ombudsman so that they can take recourse to them. Then this, the regulated entities are also supposed to ensure that the salient features of the scheme are displayed in English, Hindi and the regional languages in all its offices and branches and places of business so that any person visiting them these uh, premises of the bank has adequate knowledge and information about the scheme. Then, apart from this, the entire copy of the scheme is supposed to be kept available in all its branches so that in case the customer wants to have a look at it, he will, should be in a position to take that and go through it. Then, the details of all this the scheme, then the details of the nodal officers, etc., have to be placed in the in the regulated entities website as well to popularize the scheme or to make people aware of the channels. Then removal of difficulties, uh, RBI may make provisions which are not inconsistent with the parent enactments for removing difficulties and giving effect to the scheme. Then section 20 talks, uh, rule, clause 20 talks about repeal of existing schemes uh, and application to existing proceedings. So here, the, the Ombudsman Scheme 2000, uh, Banking Ombudsman Scheme, Ombudsman Scheme for NBFCs and Ombudsman Scheme for Digital Transactions have been repealed from 12-11-2021, but whatever complaints are pending, appeals are pending or awards are pending execution, they will continue to be disposed of in the respective Ombudsman Scheme. So this is as far as the Ombudsman Scheme is concerned. So basically, Ombudsman, Deputy Ombudsman, then the uh, channels of making complaints online, offline, uh, offline in physical mode or through email. Then uh, online through the complaint portal or through email. Then the centralized processing, the uh, complaints processing center, which is uh, located in Chandigarh, where the grievances are examined. Then first thing, before approaching the ombudsman, they will have to write to the regulated entity, get their response, or if no response is required, received, file a complaint with the ombudsman. Then the complaint will be facilitated first, sending a copy of it to the regulated entity, receiving a response with documents, forwarding this response and documents to the customer. If that satisfies, then close the uh, resolved. If it is not satisfied, facilitation, so mediation and conciliation will be attempted wherever it's possible or necessary, a meeting will also be conducted. Then based on that, if settlement is arrived at, it is documented, then the timelines are there. And once it is done, it will be treated as settled, then treated as resolved by agreement. Then where that is not possible, then you have the system where you are going into 
uh, either rejection of the complaint or you are filing an award. And once an award or where the complaint is rejected on appealable grounds, there could be an, uh, an appeal which can be filed with the appellate authority. The appellate authority can uphold the order or award. He can cancel the order or uh, award. Then he can make modifications. He can remand the matter or he can pass such other order as is necessary. Then popularizing the scheme and publicity and having in place principal nodal officer and nodal officers for making uh, their presence and also for responding by furnishing documents that is supposed to be done by the ombudsman. So this is, and as far as the grounds of uh, complaint are concerned, any ground is there where there is a deficiency of service. However, certain grounds are excluded. So it should not be in those excluded grounds and it should be a maintainable complaint. So this is as far as the ombudsman scheme is concerned. Okay, thank you.